So I am a firm believer in the process and that there are no shortcuts. However, a lot of us are taking either extremely long detours or staying in a holding pattern. And so we are taking a lot longer to get to our goals than we want to. And one of those big reasons is procrastination. Uh, we procrastinate so hard, often we are ignoring the very things that we're procrastinating. Uh, we don't even want to take a good look at our priorities because if we did that, we would have to acknowledge that there's something important that we're putting off. So how do we deal with procrastination and what is the root? I'm going to talk about this. I'm Alec from Easier Habits. I coach technical startups and companies and teams in things like hiring, training, agile method and productivity, but I also just work with a lot of entrepreneurs who are in their heads a lot. I am one of them actually, uh, and are dealing with uh, procrastination. In fact, I'm about to go on a trip. And if you've ever gone on a trip, that's when you start to realize all the things you haven't done and what are the little things, but also what are the big things that you've been putting off. So uh, I am hypersensitive about the procrastination and I just had to sit down and make this video because that is, uh, you know, I'm realizing like, you know, as, as I'm seeing all of these things that I'm not doing or having a difficult time doing or, you know, the looming deadline, the things I really don't want to do before I leave for my trip, my anxiety is spiking um, and I'm noticing some patterns in how procrastination works and what's at the root of it. And this is the procrastination cure you don't want to hear. <laughs> um, it is uh, how to deal with the root of the procrastination and it will give you a lot more power and control in your life, but it is by doing the thing you least want to do when you're procrastinating. It's, it is the thing you're avoiding, not just the task, but the thing that keeps you avoiding that task that you're gonna have to deal with head on. So I'm gonna talk about that. And so really there are, I guess, two roots of quote unquote procrastination, which is one, you didn't want to do the, the thing in the first place and it's an obligation from somebody else. And I'm not really going to address this. This is like, the, the problem is you don't wanna do it. <laughs> Uh, not that you're lazy and a lot of the times this is lazy. Now you can, with this first case, I'm just going to touch on it really lightly. Um, but you know, one, one of the problems is, are you getting yourself into a situation where you're obligated to do things for somebody else and not delivering, right? And the problem there is say no more. <laughs> That's the real solution to this problem. Uh, you know, a, if you're already obligated to something and you can't step out of it, the other way is to try and, you know, find some angle of the relationship. This person matters to you. Therefore the, you know, the task matters to you. All right, that's the simple idea. But this is not, uh, this is not really for me procrastination. Like the root uh, and worst and nastiest kind of procrastination, the kind that we really beat ourselves up for, is the things we actually want to do. The things we believe might change our life, but we can't, our lives, but we can't bring ourselves to do them. And the root of this is really something more like uh, you want the end result. So there's no questions about that, but you don't believe you can get the end results. You don't believe the end result is likely. And our brains are actually hardwired to prevent you from wasting effort because you know living and thinking and breathing and just being a human being takes enough calories. Our brains are huge, they take a ton of calories. Uh, and so to be efficient, we are discouraged by our brains from doing lots of effort for low reward activities. So naturally see, trying to seek high reward activities. The pro one of the problems nowadays is that our brains, uh, or we have so, so many things that are like mental candy for us. Like all of the reward, just like sugar, with none of the nutritional value. So that you can spend your time in things that are highly that feel highly rewarding in the moment to your brain, but that are not actually rewarding or not actually transforming your life. Um, and there's nothing you can do about the way your brain has evolved. However, all right, the root there, the likelihood piece of this is where we can dive into it. Why do you think it's not likely that you'll get the outcome? Well, the first thing that's gonna come to mind is obstacles. So um, if I'm thinking right before I leave, uh, you know, I'm trying to get ready and focused on my trip 
and my brain is thinking, if I you shoot out a few more emails for contracts before I go, um, you know, what does a few more emails matter? It takes a lot of emails to, uh, you know, to land a new contract. Uh, I'm gonna have limited capacity for dealing with it if uh, if I um, do deal, you know, if I do have, you know, if I do get an email back while I'm on break or, or you know, on my trip, right? Then then maybe I'll have to be checking my email constantly and I'll be anxious that, you know, and I have all of these excuses built up and all of those obstacles, right? But at the root of this, you know, and this is one way you can see through this likelihood thing, if you're in the likelihood trap, is like, all right, well, what if you it was assured? What if I sent an email right now and I knew someone would be like, hey, Alec, that's great. Here's a giant uh, six-figure contract uh, or five-figure contract for, you know, this period of time uh, that met all my expectations, you know, and if I got that email in 10 minutes right, you know, right after sending it um, and I could say, great, let's do it. Uh, would I do that? Would that worth? Would that be worth like checking a few emails on break? Absolutely, right? It's the likelihood piece. Like I am not going to get a ten minute response from someone, almost guaranteed. So it's the likelihood piece. Uh, but we can peel back the layers of this likelihood, right? So why are you procrastinating? You want the result, but you think it's not likely. Why is it not likely? Well, there are obstacles, right? The people I'm sending emails to are not. Um, you know, they're getting lots of other emails. It's hard to get noticed. It's hard to pay attention. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to get their attention. Um, and so, um, and then a lot of times we just stop at this level of analysis and we write it off. Uh, we're still not at the root. Uh, the exercise I'm doing here, by the way, is the seven whys exercise. So when something goes wrong or you're dealing with something difficult uh, or you're trying to define, decide what you really want in a positive sense, you start with what comes to mind first and then you go to why. So I don't want to do this. Why? Uh, because, uh, you know, do I want, do I not want the result? No, I do want the result. Uh, I just feel it's unlikely. Why is unlikely? Obstacle, right? So like obstacle is the response to the second why. The first why is it's not likely. The second, you know, why am I not doing this? I don't think it's likely. Second obstacle. But the third is why is that obstacle a problem? Why is it a problem that they're busy? Because I don't believe I can get their attention. Why? Okay, so the third why down here as we're tracing the root of procrastination so we can deal with it and give you control is generally I don't believe I can, right? So it's it's not that there's an obstacle, uh, you know, but why is the obstacle a problem? I don't think I can get around it. You know, why not? I don't know how. Why don't I just uh, go research? Why don't I find an example of someone who did get around it and what did they do? Well, that looks like a lot of work, <laughs> you know. Why, you know, why am I afraid of doing the work, right? If I knew, even if I had to send out 100 emails, uh, or whatever, do a hundred pieces of work, but I was, you know, I knew that they got results at number a thousand or number five thousand or whatever. Uh, why don't I just chug through it? And then that's the point where now several whys, this kind of after three kind of, um, you know, you go through a few really quickly and it depends, but eventually you get to, usually before seven, that I'm afraid of rejection or I don't think I have enough resources to, you know, present myself well in, you know, while I'm in this crazy state of preparing for my, uh, before for my trip. I'm, you know, what, why is it a problem not to just sit down and, and okay, I don't have a lot of time to shoot off a few ones. <laughs> well, I'm afraid of rejection and I want to make these emails, you know, the best possible emails and get their attention. I don't like how I feel when I send out emails and get no response. And so instead of looking at this as a process, like I just sit down and, and do your thing, because if I keep doing that every day, I will get results. Even if these ones are not perfect, I'll learn how to do it better, I'll tweak as I go, right? You know, like that process, like, you know, isn't a problem. Why don't I just sit down and do what I have with the time that I have? Well, it's rejection. I'm, I'm, I'm putting gates in front of myself. And these are the detours or holding patterns that I talked about. I'm saying I, uh, I can't send out emails for contracts if I, you know, I can't send out emails for contracts unless 
I can do X, Y, Z things, have like a personalized resume and cover letter or, you know, personally reach out to someone like I can't, those are not bad things to do, but if they prevent me from doing, taking any action, right, because I'm constructing these elaborate requirements, well, it is totally possible. I could send out an email to a contract, uh, you know, uh, to someone who posted a contract, right, for example, and get a response back, even if they've got, you know, lots of other people. Um, you know, it is possible I could cold outreach someone who I think might be looking for the type of work that uh, I want to do for them. And, you know, it's totally possible that they might be excited to hear about what I have to offer, right? Rather than being, you know, just screening that out as another email. And so it's not a technical requirement. And this is another sign that we're procrastinating, right? I can't do this yet. I have to do X, Y, Z big thing. I have to prove myself. I have to, this has to be better. This has to be polished, etc. Those are all often forms of procrastinating because we're afraid of rejection. And the problem with all of that procrastination, now we're kind of at the root of it, right? The fear, this, anything that is, you actually want the results, but you're not taking the action, is some kind of fear, anxiety of not being enough, anxiety, you know, fears around rejection, whatnot. That is the root of the procrastination. And so, um, and this is what, you know, what causes you detours. So any of the, any times you're, you're saying that I can't, I can't take action A yet because B has to be done first. A lot of the times you take a hard look at B and you're like, is this a requirement? You know, does this need to be present in all cases for success? <laughs> and often the answer is no. It's a crutch to prevent you from getting the project done sooner and facing rejection, right? Why are you not writing? Why are you not sending your writing to publishers as a creative or whatever? Why are you not recording that video? Why are you not pitching that product? Why are you not sending out that email, etc.? All of those crutches. Like the, the, the truth of it is, right? Even, even if this is something that depends on somebody's action, uh, there's nothing preventing you from going out and having that conversation with a person that, uh, you want a promotion from, you want to become a new customer, you want to, um, you know, you want to do a collaborative partnership with whatever it is, right? There's really nothing keeping you from just reaching out, uh, reaching out to them and all of these other ancillary, well, I have to do this so that I can get a big result. Well, you know, sorry to burst your bubble, but like most chances you er, you know, the truth is no matter how little or much you do for most people, you won't have a big result because you're not the right person at the right time. But if you don't talk to a lot of people, you won't find who is the right person at the right time and what are the right words to say, etc. Right. And so this perfectionism is keeping you from the volume of practice that you need to actually get good quickly. And this can keep you in a holding pattern indefinite. This can be an indefinite detour. So there are no shortcuts, right? You have to do the volume of work uh, in order to reach your goal, whatever it is. Uh, and there's no shortcut to doing that volume of work, but chances are you're not even doing it yet. You're not even doing the things that would matter the most. And alas, um, all right, we have the root. What do we do about it? Well, here's an analogy that's really helpful for me. I used, I'm afraid of heights. And I used to think I was afraid of heights because I was afraid of falling. And then I went skydiving. And the interesting thing about skydiving, like I was anxious in the plane before going, and then you're strapped to like a professional person who's handling the parachute and all of that. Um, and they, you kind of walk to the door and you know, your heart is rising into your throat and your like stomach is all tense and everything. Uh, and you're hanging out of the plane attached to somebody who's still holding onto the plane. And then they let go and your stomach jumps. This is like the period of greatest fear. And then you level out and the wind is rushing past you and falling is not scary. It's not really scary at all, especially when you're jumping out of a plane. Now, like if you get really close to the ground without a parachute, might be a lot more scary. But most of that fall is not scary at all because the ground is so far away, right? Like there are no consequences. And you know, in the case of skydiving with someone else, someone's handling the parachute, a professional, you're fine. Um, and one of the things I learned from it is I'm not afraid of falling. I'm afraid of that uncomfortable feeling of losing my balance when I start to fall, 
when you actually are falling, that feeling of losing your balance, that discomfort is gone. And so a lot of my anxiety is like all this anxiety of, of, of heights isn't for the whole trip. It's just that one moment of starting to fall that I really, really want to avoid. All right, how does this relate to procrastination? Well, uh, I think what most of us do with procrastination is we have, we have two modes. We have the I'm distracted, I'm not even thinking about or engaging in the task I'm procrastinating. Uh, either I'm completely checked out on like YouTube, video games, social media, whatever, <laughs> right? Uh, Netflix, watching something, right? I'm completely distracting myself from it. Um, I could be, you know, distracting myself with that. I could be distracting myself with other less important work that, you know, we do a lot. So I'm doing a lot of things that really are no conceivable way are going to lead me to the desired outcomes or the desired outcomes at the level that I want. You know, they're not the actions that people have done this successfully in the past or, you know, did to get to there, uh, to get to where they are, etc. They're not, you know, like they're not helpful, but they keep you busy and they keep you from thinking about the thing you're distracting. So there's distraction mode. And then once we can no longer ignore what we're procrastinating, we got to do something, we have a deadline, we have some kind of commitment, then we jump into uh, frantic work on the thing we're procrastinating. I'm going to call it frantic focus. And this focus, uh, we don't have the time we need for this. It's highly stressed out. You, you don't have like the kind of open, playful, a playful, creative mindset that's really going to get the most out of, uh, help you get the most out of this situation, especially if this involves other people, right? You are much more likely to stand out, make connections if you're having fun, if you're playful, if you're curiosity, if, if you're curious or whatnot. Uh, but in frantic focus, you don't have any of that stuff. This is mode two. And the reason, and, and it functions basically almost as much as, um, as distraction. Because we are working on the thing. We've been pushed. We have a deadline. We're, we're working furiously to, um, to get done. But we're still also furiously or frantically avoiding dealing with the procrastination itself. And it just becomes a pattern. So we distract, distract, distract. And then we flip into a period of intense focus where we do get stuff done, not to a high quality. We don't have enough time of it, but where we're essentially still distracted. And the thing we're avoiding, just like jumping out of the plane, is that that moment of engaging with our anxiety, of sitting with our anxiety. So all of this, whether distraction, frantic focus, has been to avoid engaging with our uh, anxiety. As long as we are trying to avoid that bottom level anxiety, I'm not good enough, I will be rejected, I will feel terrible, I'll never go, you know, like that critical, it's fear of, actually probably more than anything else, it's fear of the critical voice in your own head um, and not uh, even other people's rejection because other people, most of the time when they reject you, they just move on, there's no consequence. It's how you feel, the story you're going to tell yourself when you're rejected, right? You're avoiding thinking about that anxiety. And as long as you're avoiding it, it controls you. It controls you and drives you to distraction so you don't have enough time to work on the things you want. And then even when you're in frantic focus mode, it controls you because you can't slow down, you can't be present, you can't bring the best of yourself to the task because you're in shutting off that part of your mind. Once you can face that anxiety with confidence, then you have a lot more control over when you start and how you engage in the project. You have a lot more uh, ability to choose what you focus on. And that's really the heart of this. When you're really anxious about something, when you're really stressed, your stress chemicals are actually focus chemicals, but very typically they don't help you uh, control what you focus on. They're kind of, they're often very reactive focus chemicals. And what you want is to be able to focus on doing the task in a way that is most you, that is most expressive, expansive, confident, playful, curious, um, and authentic, right? All of those things. That's, that's what you want to be able to do. And you're not going to get that if you're stress focused on something. 
So, uh, and this seems like that would be some a great another video sometime to like dive into, you know, the states of focus and the neurochemistry of that. Uh, another time, I'm sure Huberman uh, is it Andrew or Alex? Alex? Anyway, Huberman uh, has has uh, it does a podcast on on um, the neurobiology of stuff. If you're interested in this, you can look him up. So. Uh, but what in my experience or practice with myself, with people I coach is that you have to, uh, be able to face this anxiety. And once you face that anxiety, you have control, not that it goes away. So what I'm not going to promise you is that one, no shortcuts, but you can stop taking detours. Um, and then two, not that you will banish anxiety, but you will be able to look it in the eye and choose how you react to it and how you're going to do this really it's about time most of us because we move from distraction to frantic focus we don't give ourselves the time to practice dealing confidently with anxiety and what does that uh what does that look like it's not just sitting there being anxious right uh, good practice is not is a combination of two things it's time so you can't just if, you're, if you want to deal with procrastination, it's just not going to be an intellectual epiphany, a realization like, oh, I procrastinate because that's what I saw my parents doing or I was tra traumatized by this rejection or that failure, right? It doesn't matter. You can realize that and go to therapy and realize that and still have the same problems, right? Because you haven't practiced, uh, no matter what you realize, you need the, the time practicing dealing with that anxiety in a positive fashion. Now, it's not just time because you can sit there and brood endlessly on your anxiety and make it worse, right? Procrastinate more or feel worse about yourself. Um, and so for me, and this is a little bit of personal practice, but it's inspired by other things like rain. What does it look like dealing with the anxiety that's the root of my procrastination so that I have control over what I do and do not do? Uh, and how I do it. So um, really three root elements that you need to a good practice. So one, you know, have the time, sit down, uh, you know, brew yourself a cup of, like I did a hot herbal tea today. <laughs> and just like, ah, yes, enjoy that, right? Let your, let your uh, or go for a walk, etc. Do something that, that uh, can offset some of the anxiety you can, uh, or listen to soothing nonverbal music in the background. So, so you can set yourself up for success. Give yourself a boost there, right? Um, I, I guess that's just a prep or a little hack. But the three things that you really need to practice, however you get to them, are first, awareness. And this is the hardest part. Like, if you can do this, you probably won the battle. There's other pieces you need to practice to do this successfully, but this is the hardest part. And if you can do this, you can probably do the rest. So awareness is just taking the time to sit down and thinking, what am I feeling? And that whole process, right, of uh, what I did about the outreach, the whys, uh, will come later. Right now, all you have to think is, what am I feeling? Whew, I'm feeling a tightness in my chest because I've been thinking about, you know, things that I'm procrastinating. Um, I'm feeling whew, slightly lightheaded. I'm feeling a nice afterburn from that herbal tea, <laughs> right? But like the sitting, the taking it in and sitting with that tightness in, in the chest, like, ooh, I can breathe into it. I can try and relax, but I'm not trying to shove it out of my mind, right? I'm not scrolling through my Facebook feed to ignore the fact that my chest feels tight and uncomfortable. I'm sitting here in my skin, in my body, being aware of it. And I'm sitting with that emotion for a while. And this is, you know, technically I'm kind of, rolling two steps of rain into one uh rain is recognize allow investigate nurture for me it's it's just awareness is kind of the uh recognize and allow just sit a moment in awareness of the emotion and and just by doing this action you're looking that anxiety in the eye and being able to coexist with it you don't have to flee from it you don't have to do what it says. You don't have to do anything. Um, you can now treat it as a part of your life, but not the whole of your life, not driving your life, etc. And so now you have just in being aware of it, taken back control. However, to be effective 
uh, really managing this anxiety, you need to move on to step two, which you've already gotten the momentum. You've, you've broken the momentum of distraction and the tendency and often the addictions that come, like digital addictions and other addictions that come from seeking distraction from the thing that's causing you anxiety, right? So you've broken that cycle and you're building momentum towards, you know, kind, healing, healthy approach to life by just sitting there and being aware of it. But step two is curiosity. So why am I feeling this way? Uh, it's the investigate portion of RAIN, if you're familiar with, you know, Tara Brock's radical compassion and things like that. Uh, but I like curiosity. It's something that some of the meditation courses that I have uh, taken have constantly reaffirmed that you should have a sense of curiosity about the things that come up. Not necessarily judgment, you're not a bad person because when you're meditating something comes up in your head, but have a sense of curiosity like, huh, that's interesting that that happened. It's interesting that that's the place my brain goes when I make it empty, etc. So what you want is to move towards away from judgment and towards curiosity. So I am feeling tight in the chest. What about this makes me nervous? And this is the wise exercise I talked about earlier. All right, I am anxious about doing X. Why? Obstacle. Why? I don't think I can overcome that obstacle. Why? Etc. You know, several levels down to fear. And again, this might generate an epiphany, but you're not really done. This is not something, this is not a practice that you finish with once you're like, okay, I got seven whys down and I really hit the root of the anxiety right here. I know what it is, I'm done. No, this is a practice, right? So you wanna practice being aware of what you're feeling. You wanna practice curiosity, honesty, and getting to the root so that when you feel this emotion, you can recognize you'll, you'll, you'll what this looks like as you practice it is not that um, you reach an epiphany or not, right? It's not the epiphany is the, the, what, what matters. What you're decreasing as you practice this repeatedly is the time between um, when you feel something and the time between you recognize the root cause. And so if you're starting out, you can go hours, days, weeks, right? Feeling anxious, but not ever sitting down to be aware, right? It could take a long time. If you get practice, with this awareness and this curiosity, right? What happens is you're like, hey, my chest is feeling tight. I'm really anxious about being rejected when I do this, <laughs> right? That can compress in your daily life into a few moments, saving you all of that time, the minutes, the hours, the weeks, right? There's no shortcut. You have to practice doing this regularly. I would start, you know, with five minutes a day. Uh, with the thing that you're most anxious about. I'd practice five minutes a day and then you can bring that, you know, longer to get more practice or whatever. Go through these, do reps like you would with a physical exercise. Uh, but then you'll find if you do the, the work regularly, right, in your daily life outside of your practice, that you can go from stress to realization of the stress to the third step, all right, the kindness or nurturing in RAIN, you can go to the third step in, in this process a lot faster. And that's the idea, is to being able to move quickly from stress to kind response that then disarms the anxiety, that then allows you to choose what you're working on and when you're working on and how, rather than reacting to the anxiety. So uh, the third step, right, after you're aware, after you're curious, you get to the root of it, right? Before you get to the root of it, kindness is not going to help, right? If you think, um, uh, you know, why don't I, um, you know, why, okay, I, I'm not sending out emails today because uh, I, people are busy and I don't think they're going to get back to me. Um, okay, let's be kind about that. All right, um, it, it's okay if people don't get back to you. So, right, like the kindness doesn't work um, if you don't do the curiosity. So you want to do the awareness, the curiosity. Now that I know I am afraid of uh, the obstacle is getting people's attention. And I'm not only, I'm not even just afraid of rejection. I'm afraid of the stories I tell myself with, uh, I'll tell myself with, um, 
when I get rejected, right? The inner critic. That is what I'm terrified of. I'm most terrified of myself. This is my shadow or whatever Jungian stuff. I'm actually, you know, not super expert at that. But there's a piece of yourself that you're avoiding and that's that's what I'm avoiding, right? And so now that I, I am either at the root or deeper, right? I find there's always a level deeper you can go. But uh, as long as I'm pretty deep, all of a sudden kindness becomes a lot easier. So I am afraid of what I'm gonna tell myself. Well, self, I can write a positive story. So I'm gonna write this story down. Um, I'm gonna write the story that I'm gonna pat myself on the back. Uh, you know, I'm gonna, uh, all right, I'm going to spend X amount of minutes applying to jobs. Um, I'm, you know, and I'm gonna pat myself on the back because I'm about to leave and I still, and I intended to do half an hour or whatever it is, hour of sitting down and applying for contracts, um, you know, uh, emailing people out or doing cold outreach and pitching people. I'm gonna spend my time doing that. And then at the end, I'm going to have another cup of herbal tea and say, Alec, you did what you intended to do. Even though you're going on a trip, you're the boss. <laughs> Right? Um, uh, and not only that, right, I'm gonna learn how to do it better. So this is gonna be real kindness. I'm not just superficial kindness, I'm not just saying nice things. So maybe also as a reward, I'm gonna find people who are good at networking and I'm gonna learn how to do just this just a little bit better. So I can be more confident, more creative, better at reaching out to people. Or I'm gonna try something or maybe, um, when I do this this work, it feels repetitive and mind-numbing and soulless if I do it in a certain way, right? Um, there are a lot of like online job boards where it's really easy to apply to jobs, but because of that, they get tons of applicants and you get no response and eventually it kind of like saps the life out of you. Well, I'm gonna try something different. I'm going to look up all of these companies. I'm gonna look up on LinkedIn who's in their engineering team and I'm going to say, um, hey, saw you guys had this opening. I, you know, there was an opening at this company. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's, you can find the person at the exact branch for whom the opening is, but like, hey, could I ask you some questions about how the company runs and how it goes? Um, and, you know, make some connections. And then at the end, yeah, anyway, but yeah, so it's like, all right, oh yeah, that's a, that's kind. Like going, like doing something that's going to make me more effective. And then when I do that, whether or not they reach out, I'm going to uh, have that cup of herbal tea <laughs> and I'm going to, you know, do something uh, I enjoy, etc. But anyway, that's, you know, all, all of a sudden get to the root and have all sorts of ideas how to be kind. Now, this also takes practice. And so, you know, eventually, again, what this looks like is moving from never being kind to yourself and spending weeks or months avoiding things and then being you know furiously in action, um, being controlled by that critic, not ever working as effectively as you could, right? Um, and to the end result is you recognize, oh, my chest is tight, oh, whew, it's the, I'm worried about my, my internal critic when I don't hear back from jobs or I get a rejection or contracts or whatever. Um, I'm worried about the internal critic. All right, well, here are the things I've done in the past that are nice to me, or the ways to be kind to myself, right? And then all of a sudden, I'm choosing to work, I'm choosing to work in a more effective manner, and the experience of it is less stressful, uh, meaning I'm gonna show up better, more confident, I'm gonna be able to connect with people better, et cetera. And so that happens uh, faster or even just becomes part of your process, right? You start baking that into your daily routine. Here's when I do that hard thing for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour, an hour a day, you know, uh, every week adding a little bit more time, for example, stretching that out. Here's the time when I do that and as part of my routine, here's how I, you know, get in the zone. Here's how I celebrate my work afterwards. Here's how I make sure that I learn so I don't feel like I'm stuck in a trap. Uh, or I'm full of BS, um, and then that just becomes a part of your daily routine. So that is a very in-depth look at procrastination. So, um, all right, the advice, in a nutshell, the procrastination cure you don't wanna hear, 
is that you have to spend time with the root of your anxiety that's causing the procrastination. And you have to spend time with awareness, curiosity, and kindness. Or, as I like to say, ACK! <laughs> um, so, uh, it's a great acronym, huh? Awareness, curiosity, kindness, ACK. <laughs> it kind of sums up my initial feeling about sitting down with that anxiety. Um, anyway, I hope this has helped you. Uh, this is not something... These are... Pieces of this I use regularly with clients. Uh, I use this for myself, uh, this framework for myself. I was starting to do it today as I was super anxious before I leave. Uh, I was leaving about there's so much to do, and uh, and and my mental voice, my mental critic was putting me in a bind. All right, it, you know, you're just not doing applying for contracts today because you're lazy. And then, you know, justifying that, no, nah, there's not a lot of time. I wouldn't get contracts anyway. But none of that was really freeing me from my inner critic. Whereas sitting down, whew, being aware, even talking about it in front of the camera, going through this process in front of the camera actually has lightened up my, ch like the stress in my chest a little bit. I can still feel it. All right. I'm not promising you that the anxiousness goes away. I'm just promising you that you can look it in the eye and then choose what you do. And the more you practice this, the greater your, the, the faster that process is and the greater your scope of action. So uh, I hope this is helpful. I would really love to hear if you try this out, how this works for you, questions or comments below, please leave them. And if this video has been helpful, please like and subscribe. I have uh, usually daily live content. I'm going, uh, this is filmed for vacation, but I normally have daily content often with me and my wife right now. Our big, our biggest goal is to, in about eight months, take her from uh, really no client acquisition process, referral only process for getting clients, um, kind of inconsistent and not, not the number of clients at the rate she'd want. Um, and then try and see if in eight months we can move her to a repeatable client acquisition model. And, you know, that comes with working through all of this things like procrastination, anxiety, difficulty focusing, uh, all the warts. We are not, you know, one of those picture perfect after the fact success stories sanitized for you about how we overcame, like we're in the middle of it. Uh, and we're documenting it as we go. So uh, I hope that's helpful. You can join us at 8 a.m. Central uh, time for our live stream or catch the videos later. Please like, subscribe, share so that we can build a community of entrepreneurs uh, who are dealing with all of this, you know, messy mental head game, but who can look it in the eye and then choose how to respond and take control of their work. All right. Thank you so much for listening till the end and until tomorrow, make big changes one small habit at a time.